Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 416. I'm Gavin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 7th of July, 2018, and the Feast of St. Thomas More. Okay, I, I'm assuming you're back at the castle. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm back at my little water mill. And I, I've come over, Kevin, on, on my motorbike because um, it's too expensive to take the car, and the sure. motorbike is a tenth price. Uh, and, and also, my wife needs a car as well. But um, there's only a small box at the back, and I had to choose between clean underwear and your microphone. <laughs> so I, I chose clean underwear, and I'm really sorry. If the quality of this broadcast is less than it should be, it's because I smell sweeter than I would be otherwise. Yeah, you, you are proud to walk around in your undies. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't walk around with them. I just have them walk. <laughs> it's high speed, not fashion. <laughs> oh, I hope people respect this show as much as we do. Um, before you guys go any further, we want you to like the show. There's either a like button on Facebook or a like button on YouTube where you are. Click it. And click the share button before you watch the show. There's no reason to watch the show and decide whether you're not going to share it. Share it now. Also, we're getting a lot more comments in the comment sections on YouTube. You guys are welcome to comment there. We read them. Uh, sometimes we respond to them. Sometimes we ignore them. But that's that's just who we are. And also, I said share, like, comment. That's good. Subscribe. Don't forget to click the subscribe button to make sure you get the latest updates on the next Anglican Unscripted. And I notice my audio here is a little less than yours. I'm going to turn it up just a little bit. And we are good to go. So, Gavin, um, the Bishop of Durham over there has sent out a little letter uh, expressing his new concerns about confessions and absolutions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I guess, you, what, not Durham? No, not, not the Bishop of Durham. No, we, we Bishop of Dover. Dover, Durham. Durham. Canterbury, they're all the same. Okay, Dover. <laughs> okay, Dover has uh, sent out a, a letter about uh, his concerns over confessions and absolutions in regards to safeguarding. And I thought you and I could talk about this because this is going to change, at least in you know Anglican uh, Roman Catholic terms, change two thousand years of precedent. So uh, help me understand what the current rules are and what he's proposing. Okay, well, the background to this, Kevin, is that the Church of England is in a panic. It, it's, it hasn't managed safeguarding very well. Um, the fact is that a lot of the time, it, expectations are, are mistaken. The whole idea we can provide safe spaces for people in, in or out of the Church um, is, is questionable because, because of sin. But nonetheless, organizations need to run as carefully as possible. And it's certainly true the Church of England has done very badly in the current the cover-up of safeguarding. So, um, because of the kind of moral panic that has ensued a, a few inquiries, people are beginning to overreact. And one of the overreactions came from the Bishop of Dover. And he wrote a letter to all his clergy saying, you'd better warn people that if ever they come and make their confession to you, and frankly, they don't much, because, because the Bishop of Dover doesn't have many Anglo-Catholics in his diocese. Two or three, but nonetheless, he wrote to all the clergy. If anyone comes and makes their confession to you, you need to warn them you may turn state's evidence. You may be forced to go to the police and denounce them if it involves uh, a, a serious sin of sexual abuse. Now, this is overkill at so many levels. First of all, very few people make their confession. Secondly, the ones that do come in with a small list of boring sexual sins and a few spiritual ones that, that hardly ever change. The number of paedophiles or, or even murderers or rapists who go and make their confession to a priest, I think is probably infinitesimally small. So in a sense, this feels like gesture politics to me. Yeah, I, I get that too, because you probably get once in a century somebody who comes in and confesses to a murder uh, or somebody who confesses to uh, sexual impropriety where they're not outside the statute of limitations. And I think... They're going for virtual signaling here or some type of 
Uh, we've done it wrong in the past. We're going to change that. The right way to do it is to change a rule that's never, ever implied anyway. I think it's exactly right. I mean, the people have got a sort of the image of, of Hollywood confessions where the priests hear the most extraordinary uh, dramatic news, but 99.9% but .9 of confession isn't like that at all. Uh, and, and so you've got to, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It feels like virtue signaling. But the problem with the virtue signaling is it, it undermines the whole sanctity of confession. And, and, and more than that, it, it signals a shift in the church's concern from safeguarding of the soul, which ought to be preeminent, mm -hmm. to safeguarding of the body or, or, or social criteria. And, and in fact, of all the things the church ought to be concerned about, it ought to be safeguarding of the soul. Because one of the things that the church is in the business of, 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 of calling out sin, of inviting people to repentance, of offering them Christ's absolution if they repent uh, and then act accordingly. But to use this as a form of, of pro-safeguarding virtue signaling, I think is, is, is poor. Well, I need to make a confession here. I've never uh, asked for a yeah. confession and absolution where the priest said I needed to go to the, the local police and, and make a confession first. Um, well, but shouldn't that be part of absolution? This, the absolution is a spiritual process that involves your, uh, you know, Hail Marys, uh, 15, you know, Psalm 52s, you know, but also you need to go to the police station and confess and that's your absolution. You've got to put things right where you can. Yeah. And now, now, a priest may want to use his uh, relationship with the Holy Spirit, uh, not just to impose a law, but to say, what is the best, most wholesome thing we can do in this particular case? People shouldn't be afraid that by going to see a priest that they're going to find some penalty imposed on them. But he will, of course, say, there has to be a change of behavior. Things that have gone wrong now must be put right. How are we going to do that? Uh, and that's part of the penance. But the idea that you start off confession by saying, by the way, I may go to the police station before you do, is, is a terrible thing. Ignore the recorder in front of you, but yes. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, let's, well, what, do, it, what it's done is it's, it's, it's General Synod is meeting now mm -hmm. uh, through the mechanism of questions. If something isn't on the agenda, you can raise questions at the beginning of the session. And a number of people, including the lay chairman of Forward in Faith, have asked serious questions about whether or not the Bishop of Dover has the power to change canon law, because canon law says that confession is sacred. And so here's a bishop saying, never mind what canon law says, this is what I'm telling you to do. And the fear here is it's not just confession, but our listeners know very well that we've been worried that the Church of England may progress on the basis that while it keeps canon law in place for certain things, it ignores it in practice. And here's another example of it trying to do just that. Hmm. There's lots of strange news going on. I read my paper this morning, and it said that you guys are going to have car boot sales. Now, in America, we call them garage sales. Uh, here okay. in the, the East Coast, we call them tag sales. I don't know why. In England, you call them car boots, and you're going to sell your cathedrals to make money uh, to avoid bankruptcies. Uh, what's the news on that? Well, we might call them automobile trunk sales, but okay. we, we, for the moment, <laughs> oh. but Kevin, what's in the last couple of years? Um, two cathedrals, three cathedrals, have come perilously close to going bankrupt. Bradford Cathedral. Uh, almost did go bankrupt and had to enter into a special um, voluntary insolvency agreement with its creditors who, who didn't push it over the edge but came to some agreement about how much money in the pound they would recover. At the same time, Exeter Cathedral and I think Peterborough Cathedral were being run very badly indeed and were running out of money. Now, um, the, the, this alerted the Church of England to the fact that all was not well in the running of their cathedrals. And, and it's true, there are medieval statutes that make decision-making very difficult. You may remember about 20 years ago, we had a huge standoff in Lincoln between the dean and his, his canons. It may not, have, may not have made the American news. I'm sure it was big over there. <laughs> I'm sure it was. But in England, it became a source of real scandal mm -hmm. uh, that these people hated each other, were locked in conflict, and neither had the power to, to solve the deadlock. So it's certainly true that the management of cathedrals 
it sometimes languishes under medieval statutes. But that being that as it is, there's still the growing problem of the Church of England running out of money on the ground. The church commissioners have a lot of money, uh, earmarked for investment, but, but the kind of day-to-day -day cash flow of parish churches and cathedrals is in a parlous condition. And, and these two cathedrals, Exeter and Peterborough, are very close to bankruptcy. So, uh, a, new, uh, a, a new commission has been launched to see if they can tidy up the way in which cathedrals are run and inevitably make them more like businesses, of course. Um, and at the same time, the newspapers have learned that these two cathedrals are insolvent. What do you do with a, a building you can't afford? You may need to go to a car boot sale and sell it. So then, but, but you know, we're used to the idea of churches being sold on. But for a medieval cathedral to be sold, not only does, is this a huge practical problem, but symbolically, it's literally the end of an era, but, but it, it's unthinkable in many ways. Yeah, and I can't imagine that, they, that nobody who buys it's going to get to knock it down. Uh, they're probably protected by historical societies and stuff like that. But just the thought that it could be a condo, uh, it could be apartment buildings, that it could be anything other than a place where you go to worship uh, and have you know the Christian community is, is amazing. There's one very beautiful church in, in Belgium or Holland, I think, a very large Catholic church uh, that was sold and, and was turned into a rock climbing center. So people filled it, and you know, they practiced climbing the buttresses, and, and, and uh, of all the things that could happen to a cathedral, that's not the worst. But, it, but, but the idea that this, this, this monument to the glory and the love and the majesty and the presence and the graciousness of God should suddenly become a recreational facility in secular life is, well, it's a dreadful sign of what's happened to Christianity in Europe. Well, here in America, if things came worse to worse there's and it was an episcopal property there's a very high probability it's going to be a muslim cultural center now people on twitter have been writing yeah. already today been saying well they'll become large mosques yep oh man that's bad um i also noticed on the uh, church of england synods website where they talk about their agenda that nukes are back in the news that they need to talk about nuclear weapons and uh, I've not seen this at any Church of England function since since Ronald Reagan sat down with Gorbachev at the salt talks so uh, what's going on? Well the conspiracy theory is that Justin Welby is not ready to launch his sexual revolution <laughs> but he's waiting until 2020 when the House of Bishops report. Now all the all the progressives use every single synod as a platform for their own particular um, exotic changes sure. to their understanding of Christian discipleship and sex. And so Justin Welby has said, well, this has got to stop for a year or two. 2018, 2019, cool it, guys. No more private motion members on on, on, on the divine right for the genitalia, or whatever it is. Um, so they've been filling the agenda with other things. Yes, and they have. What better thing could you find as a Church of England Synod to talk about than the ethics of nuclear arms? Because because the Church of England has been doing that for 40 years and, <laughs> and it's kind of used to it. So oh. they're talking about nuclear arms, they're talking about um, uh, ecumenical, ecumenical relations on a kind of mild level, membership qualifications. The kind of, um, the, the, the kind of, uh, I'm looking for the polite word, what's the word? The dross, the, the ad administrative dross of an institution. When it, when it refuses to look at the elephant in the room. The I, th I think you're right about that. Um, you and I got back from GAFCON. Uh, you said you arrived back with a, little, with a cough because you caught something in the airplane. Uh, the, the two bishops from Ireland uh, arrived back to a little bit of hostility from some people in the uh, Anglican Church in Ireland, and I thought I could get you to speak to that. Um, we have a term in uh, in America called ape crazy. Well, it's actually ape something else. But uh, this uh, canon or dean really went off on these uh, two bishops. Well, that, the, the, the Irish Times newspaper headline is, is great. It says, Bishops, presence at GAFCON, an absolute disgrace. Church of Ireland dean accuses conference, that, that's us, GAFCON, yep. of the tactical use of homophobic rallying calls. 
So apparently, Kevin, that's what we were doing over there. Two very nice bishops, Harold Miller of Down and Dromore and, and Perrin Glenfield of Kilmore, Elfin and Ardar came. And when they arrived back, the Dean of Waterford, Maria Jansen, mm -hmm. uh, a lady with a great turn of phrase and a vivid paranoid imagination, asked, asked these bishops, not, not to their faces of course, but in the media, how they could reconcile the view, the vows they made at their consecration to maintain the unity of the church when they would go to Gafcon. I guess none of us realized that by going to Gafcon we were in breach of vows or, or our commitment to Christ, to John 17, but Maria Jansen thinks that's exactly what happened. So she, speaking to the Irish Times, not to the bishops, you understand, she accused Gafcon of the tactical use of homophobic and misogynistic rallying calls to gain a base where they can access Church of Ireland governance, resources, power, I think my voice ought to raise here, I ought yes. to dribble a bit. <laughs> schools, and the young, Kevin, and the young. This has to be called out for what it is, religious extremism. And then another rector, Stephen Neal of Kelbridge, added the terms, absolute disgrace. <laughs> In Gaffron's black and white world, because Kevin, you and I are not capable of the nuances of sophisticated thought, unlike our superior brother and sister in here. There is only, and this is what we suffer from, the ruthless certainty which is hard and unforgiving and leaves no room for the doubt and questioning which leads to a richer, fuller faith. Do you not love that? Doubt and questioning leading to a richer, fuller faith. <laughs> I don't know if the audience caught this, but we just talked about nukes in the uh, Church of England. Now in the in Irish church, she's talking tactical. Well, if you put tactical and nukes together, you oh. get something very modern. It's just like they're all on the same page there, uh, Gavin. They really are. And, 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 and just this, this exercise in oxymoronic positioning is, is, is overwhelming. I mean, it's really, I think what it does is it shows, it's the, the very fear and anger that the progressives are projecting onto the orthodox is of course their own fear of anger. This is the, the vitriol of people who are very anxious and and in the kind of muddle of free thinking that they call honest and open faith. I think they're very nervous about the idea that the church might recover its biblical convictions and then and then live by them. Yeah. Because of course it circumscribes the their freedom of action. Uh, and that's why they're fighting so hard right now to get rid of God's gender. Uh, you know, if you can take away the gender, you can pretty much neutralize uh, the whole gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, you're going fi to find that very hard fought here in America at the General Senate happening in Austin this week. And uh, over time, a little bit uh, every uh, synod in Church of England. Wow. It's, yes, it's a progressive agenda in both senses. 18 minutes. That's not bad. We've got enough uh, for people to listen to and contemplate. Um, but first of all, I, I need you guys to pray for Gavin. Gavin, you're going to be having surgery in a couple weeks. Tell people what's going on. Yes, the reason I'm here in France at our, at our, our little bijou shack is because the, uh, uh, the weeds have grown and I shan't be getting back here till September because I'm going to have a, a hip operation where they slice the top of the hip joint off and <coughs> replace it with a Blended new mechanism, but you have to, you have to, you're, you can't move for six weeks afterwards. So I'm going to be incarcerated uh, in, in in my home in England, and uh, and I won't be able to get out. So I should get very bored. I'm going to try and write, and I'm hoping Kevin, you'll still call me when I'm a bit lonely. Well. Hey, <laughs> if we can record Gavin with an eye patch, we can certainly record Gavin with two crutches. It's not going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm hoping that. Um, Actually, two years of pretty serious pain and discomfort will be put uh, put behind me, and I'll be able to walk again. And um, uh, that that would be well. That's amazing, uh, Kevin. I'm so aware that without the fan the the, um, the amazing technology of modern health, I would, at my age, be both blind and lame. <laughs> and I'm very great, very grateful well, to God for well, science. Well, tell the audience how George and I tortured you. Uh, at, at General Convention, we because the General Convention is usually laid out in hotels that are two, three, four blocks apart, and we rented an Airbnb which was right across the street from the convention. Not a big deal, but uh, George and I always wanted to know what the English were doing, and the English had a hotel about three blocks away, and we would make oh. Gavin walk with us, and that was quite something, wasn't it? 
Kevin, I said to you, Kevin, how far is this hotel? And he said, it's, it's round the block. It's, it's the, next, the next block. I said, well, okay, I can do I have a range of 400 yards before the whole thing is up in an agony of, of, of thigh spasm. I said, well, I can do 400 yards. But it was about a mile and a half. <laughs> it was a New York City block. Come on. <laughs> slowed you George down and you were very patient with me and uh, mm -hmm. very kind and thank you for thank you for it <laughs> oh, it, was, it was a lot of fun we uh, we, we got to do it GAFCON should be every year as far as I'm concerned just to hang out with uh, fellow Christians and uh, to edify the body Gavin it's been fun I'm Kevin Carlson I'm Gavin Ashton and you've been listening to episode 416 of Anglican Unscripted <laughs>